Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? So today, ladies and gentlemen, what I need you to do first thing is uh, go ahead and get out your journal. Once you have your journal, what I want for you guys to do is turn to page 16 in your journal. So this is going to be my page 16. And you're going to glue today's anchor document onto page 16 in your journal. Then you're going to label the page number, page 16. You're going to go to your table of contents page. And then you're going to update your table of contents. Okay. So make sure that you update your table of contents with the topic Mexican independence. Okay. So again, the page number you're working with is page 16. You're gluing your Mexican independence anchor document onto page 16. And then you're going to your table of contents and you're updating it with Mexican independence, today's page number, page 16, and also today's date, 10, 3, 24. So pause the video so you guys can get all of that taken care of. Then when you're done, you can hop back into the video. Okay, cool. So today, what we're going to start with is we're going to start with Mexican independence. Today, we're getting into Mexican independence. So far in our story, we've talked about, sorry, we've talked about explorers coming to Texas and claiming land for Spain. We've talked about Spain building missions to protect their land that they have claimed in Texas and to keep it out of French hands. And we've talked about Spain building missions that later grew on into towns such as San Antonio and Laredo and Coahuila. All right. So we've talked about these three different things. In terms of eras, we've talked about natural Texas and its people, the regions of Texas, the Native Americans. We've talked about the age of contact, which is all about the Europeans and the explorers that came to this part of the world. And then again, we talked about Spanish colonial, which is all about the Spaniards creating the missions to keep this part of the world out of French hands. Now we're moving on to the Mexican national era. So how did New Spain turn into Mexico? During this time period, there was this thing called the caste system or classes. Um, if you were of a certain class, you didn't intermingle with the people from the other parts of the caste system. Um, Spain had classifications, again, for races which they called the caste system. The peninsulares were the people that were of Spanish blood. These people came from Spain, so they were at the very top of the triangle, all right? They were the very top of society. The criollas were people who were born in Mexico, but their families are Spanish, all right? Their parents are from Spain. They're from Mexico, they were born in Mexico, but their parents are from Spain. The mestizos were people who were of Native American and Spanish blood. So one of their parents was a Native American and one of their parents was a Spaniard. Then we have the Indios who were the natives. And then we have the slaves, the negros or the mulatos. All right. Um, a mulato would be uh, somebody who is of a slave, her a black person um, who was a slave and that had a partner who was a native person um, and them, you know, coming together and making their baby, which would be considered to be a mulatto. In this period, if you were at the very bottom, there was no way you could get to the very top. So let's say, for instance, you were an Indio or you were a Criolle. There was no way ever that you could get to the peninsular level. All right. So where you're at where you're born into is where you're going to stay for the rest of your life. And the opportunities that you had at that level were the only opportunities you would be afforded for the rest of your life. So again, because of that case system, the peninsulares knew they were at the top tier. So the peninsulares wind up taking over the Mexican government. Once the peninsulares take over the Mexican government, they mistreat the criollas, the mestizos, and the Indians. Now, when I say they mistreat them, 
I mean, they beat them, they spit on them, they, they tax them heavily, they only allow them into certain places, and they only allow them to have certain jobs. Because of this mistreatment, the Criollas wanted independence from Spain. They didn't want to be a part of Spain anymore. They said, okay, Spain lets it be okay for the Peninsulares to treat us this way. They say it's okay for the Peninsulares to tax us heavily. We're not okay with this. We don't want to be a part of this government anymore. So why are we so upset with Spain? The people were being tired of being taxed so heavily. Now, when I say taxed heavily, I mean heavily. So let's say, for instance, you're a Criolla person and you make, I don't know, a dollar, which kind of was a lot for back then, a dollar a day. If I'm a peninsular and I'm taxing the dollars that you earned, I'm going to take 90 cents of that dollar. So you only wind up with 10 cents in your pocket. The people get really upset about this. They say, they're taking all of our money. This isn't fair. So because of this, they want to revolt. They no longer want to remain a part of Spain. It's time to get the Spanish up out of this part of the world. This idea of revolting against your government didn't come out of nowhere. It came from this thing called the Enlightenment. In Europe, the Enlightenment is happening. It's a time period where great thinkers are coming up with these ideas about you as a person. One of these guys was called John Locke. His name was John Locke. He believed in this idea of the natural rights of men, which basically is sort of like our individual rights that we have today. Your individual rights say that there are certain things that the government cannot take away from you or certain rights that the government cannot take away from you. We get this idea of individual rights from John Locke's idea of the natural rights of every man. For instance, John Locke believed that if your government did not serve you, if your government was treating you poorly, you had every right to replace that government or to revolt against that government and create a new one. Because of these ideas that are happening within the Enlightenment time period, I'm so sorry, guys. The American Revolution happens. When the United States wins their independence from Britain in 1776, Mexico, or the people of New Spain, see this as an example. They see it as a beacon of hope. And so they decide, hey, if they can do it over there, we can do it over here too. Let's peace out from Spain and create our new government. So what do you notice about this map? Who owns the most land? Now it's time for us to get into independence. So Miguel Hidalgo is somebody who believes a lot in the Enlightenment. He sees or he reads about the ideas that are taking place during the time period known as the Enlightenment. He reads John Locke's ideas um, and he says, hey, we need that over here. Now, Miguel Hidalgo was a Catholic priest of Spanish descent, but he did not like the way that the peninsulares were treating the criollas, the mestizos, and the Indians. He didn't agree with the, with the mistreatment that was taking place and with the crazy taxes that were taking place. So he's encouraging now these people to fight for independence, which they later gain on September 16th, 1810. Hidalgo winds up raising 50,000 people to rise up against the peninsulares, to rise up against the Spanish government here in Mexico. And the way he did this was by giving the speech known as El Grito de Dolores, the cry of the pained. In his speech, he's calling for these people to rise up against the Spanish government. He's calling for the Criollas, the Mestizos, and the Indios to rise up against the government. He says, will you not defend your religion and rights as true patriots? Long live Our Lady of Guadalupe, death to a bad government. His speech kind of goes viral for way back in the 1800s. Everybody was talking about it. It was printed in newspapers. It was everywhere. 
the purpose of this was to get more people involved in the revolution because his ideas were spreading. The Spanish government decides that they need to go after Hidalgo. After a couple of months, he's eventually captured in 1811. When he's captured by the Spanish authorities, they execute him. And they don't execute him privately. They execute him in front of everyone in Mexico City so that they can show the people, if you revolt against Spain, we're going to execute you. All right. It was to basically show everybody, don't mess with us. Um, we're going to skip this video. Sorry, guys. Y ahora el grito de Dolores. Maybe I can't stop it. Esto fue el grito de Dolores. All right. Um, yeah, so it was just a funny video about el grito de Dolores because it trans transfers or translates into the cry of pain. Anyway, so Jose Gutierrez de Lara winds up taking the mantle from Hidalgo once Hidalgo is basically murdered. When Hidalgo is executed, the people are like, okay, so are we not doing this thing anymore? Are we not revolting anymore? What do we do? Jose Gutierrez de Lara was a huge follower of Hidalgo. And so he takes up Hidalgo's mission and he starts recruiting people again. For Mexican independence or from independence from New Spain for the, the Spanish government. He winds up gaining, gaining these supporters and eventually he declares that this part of the world known as Texas was going to be independent and that we were going to be known as the Republic of Mexico. He created an army called the Republican Army of the North and this is where we're going to stop in the story for today. Um, when you're done with your notes, make sure you go to All In Learning and your GOL for today is there. Bye.